As you may know, the Alliance is an education collaborative made of 11 colleges and universities in West Virginia, and they include Bridge Valley Community and Technical College, West Virginia State University, Marshall University, Concord University, WVU Tech, WVSOM, Bluefield State College, Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College, New River Community and Technical College, Mount West Community and Technical College, and our newest partner, the University of Charleston. We appreciate and welcome their leadership teams to this conference. Collectively, the Alliance has about 30,000 students in our area, and we have, we've had a very busy year, and you will learn much more about the Alliance and our accomplishments from Marshall University's President Jerry Gilbert on Wednesday. So now it's time for conference rules. One, learn something new. Two, take something back to your community. Three, check the schedule on West Virginia Solution, WVSolutions.net for your online program book. You can put your questions in the Q&A section with your name and email. Please remember that we are here to discuss West Virginia and here to celebrate. So please be constructive in your comments and stay positive. Take a photo and use the hashtag on social media, hashtag WVSolutions for your chance to win $25 gift cards throughout the conference. Let's highlight our state and get people talking about West Virginia. Remember that each session will be recorded for future reference. And for those of you who are wanting continuing education credits for today's sessions, please remember to put your name and your email in the chat. That's how we're taking roll. We're here to learn, and I hope to have a little fun too. So let's get started. Now I'd like to turn it over to one of our conference hosts, Brandon Dennison with Coalfield Development, to say a few words. Good morning, Brandon. Good morning, Sarah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this team again. And I have to say, you know, a lot of people work hard on this conference, but nobody works harder than you. So thank you for your leadership and for making this happen. You do a great job with it. You bring positive energy and wonderful passion for our state and our communities. I think, um, uh, and I, so my name is Brandon. I'm the founder and CEO of Coalfield Developments. Uh, we're based in Southern West Virginia. Today, I'm at the Marshall University Eye Center on the campus, uh, on the Huntington campus, uh, where it's all about entrepreneurship, innovation, uh, design thinking, very innovative space. And it felt like the right place to be for this innovative conference. This conference is happening at a, a truly historic time. It's, it's fun to say that sometimes, but I think this really is a historic time in Appalachia. You're gonna be hearing about new funding programs, increased funding programs, infrastructure bill, build back better, historically large amounts of money. And, and so we do have some interesting opportunities, but we have some challenges as well. We, we, we've got to get this right. My argument is, the more bottom up and the more grassroots the solutions that are crafted uh, to tap these new historic resources, the, the better we're gonna do. Um, so the, the federal dollars, they, they are an opportunity, but we need to view them as an investment. Uh, those dollars in and of themselves are not gonna save us, are not gonna transform our communities. It's those of us on the ground, in the trenches, in our communities, in our small communities, uh, who are going to come up with the big solutions that are going to define this this unique era of Appalachian history that I think that we're in. And the the entrepreneurial mindset is going to be key. That's part of why I wanted to be at the Eye Center today. And I think what really defines the entrepreneurial mindset is starting with what we have and then working forward towards where we want to go. So as uh, rather than complaining about what we don't have or rather than wishing for this or wishing someone would come in and do that or wishing we had more money. We start with what we have, we innovate, we collaborate um, and, and we work our way forward the best that we can with what we have. So I'm, I'm so excited to host this, uh, co-host this event today. Uh, appreciate all of you being here. I think it's more important than ever to be talking about the solutions that are found in our small communities that really are big and really are important. And it's, it's especially important because of some of the historic uh, federal investments that are going to be headed our way. I have a particular heart for Southern West Virginia. I think that um, 
you know, some other parts of the state have started to see some momentum, some economic traction, but a lot of meetings sort of end with this uh, dangler of, well, what about the southern part of the state? What are we going to do down there in the southern part of the state where the geography is so tough, where we have, you know, these health challenges, whatever, you know, I mean, you, we can spend all day on the challenges, but I see a lot of opportunities out there. And I hope that this is the time where we really do start to find the best solutions for the entire state, but especially for the southern part of the state. Uh, I, I hope that this is our time. I think that it can be. When I talk about innovation, entrepreneurship, and collaboration, there's no more collaborative organization than the West Virginia Hub. Uh, we're, we've been a proud partner of the Hub for many, many years. Uh, the Hub does exactly what I'm talking about, working at the grassroots from the bottom up to identify local leaders, local organizations who are passionate about their community, who are creative and who are committed to finding solutions. And I'm honored now to introduce Stephanie Tyree, who's executive director of the West Virginia Community Development Hub. Stephanie, great to see you. Good morning, Brandon. And good morning, Sarah, and to all our conference participants. The West Virginia Community Development Hub is thrilled to be a partner again this year in the Small Communities Big Solutions Conference. The West Virginia Community Development Hub works every year with dozens of small towns across West Virginia, working directly with hundreds of local leaders who are committed to transforming and revitalizing their communities through bottom-up solutions and through the innovative solutions that they know will work for their communities. At the Hub, our passion is supporting small communities across the state, and we do this through our community coaching services, through communications activities that lift up those voices of community leaders, and through collaborative partnerships like today's partnership with the Alliance and Coalfield Development. We know that building a strong future for West Virginia communities comes from working with community leaders on the ground and connecting across the sectors of community and economic development that are on display throughout this week's conference. This is a really innovative conference and I think one of a kind in the state, which is really looking at connecting all those different sectors that go into community and economic development. By working together across community development, workforce development, educational institutions, and our traditional economic development partners, we have the capacity to implement big solutions for small communities in West Virginia. The leadership on display throughout this week's event is just a slice of the inspirational work we see across West Virginia every day. Thank you to Sarah and the Alliance for all your work on hard work on this event. And I will echo Brandon's comment that there is no one who works harder on this event every year than Sarah. And you can see her hard work on display over the next four days. And thank you as always for your great leadership in driving forward critical partnerships that serve West Virginia communities. I'm excited to listen in to the rest of the speakers today, and I think it's time for us to get into it. So good morning and thank you again. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Brandon. Um, you are uh, dear friends personally um, to me and great partners with the Alliance. And we have great momentum together. And we I just appreciate everything that you do independently through your organizations and collectively with me. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. So it's my pleasure to officially uh, start the morning program and to turn the podium over to United States Senator Shelley Moore Capito's office. Senator Capito is the first female United States Senator in West Virginia history. Senator Capito is in a strong position to create new opportunities in the Mountain State and to fight for West Virginia priorities, jobs, and families. Unfortunately, she could not join us here today, but Bill Bissett, her senior advisor for economic development and state initiatives is here on her behalf. Bill, thank you for being here today. Please say a few words and introduce the video message from the Senator. Sarah, thanks so much. Uh, I love this conference. Uh, I've been a part of it in a previous role when I ran the Huntington Regional Chamber. It's great to be back in this new role with Capito and see so many friends and again hats off to you know Stephanie Brandon you everyone involved uh Brandon said it right this doesn't happen quickly uh it doesn't happen without effort so thank you for keeping this ball going I remember in my time in higher education it we had enough silos within instant an institution but also I think institutions themselves can wind up in silos so the more we can network 
cross pollinate, communicate, uh, find those solutions. Literally, why we're here. It's just an exciting time. And, and the senator apologizes that she can't be with us. She's traveling right now, or she would be. But uh, it's a real honor uh, to not only work for her, but also uh, serve the people of West Virginia. So very excited in my new role. I hope to see more and more of you as I get around the state in this new role as I hit month two in the, in the new job. But as Sarah said, uh, Shelly Moore Capta was first elected to the United States Senate in 2014 and reelected in 2020. She is the first female United States Senator in West Virginia's history. After serving West Virginia's second congressional district in the United States House of Representatives for 14 years, and as a member of the West Virginia House of Delegates for four years, Senator Capito decided to run for Senate to be an even stronger voice for the Mountain State. Senator Capito currently serves on the Appropriations Committee, the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, the Rules and Administration Committee, and the Environment and Public Works Committee as ranking member. A lifelong West Virginian, Senator Capito was born in Glendale in the Northern Panhandle. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Zoology from Duke University and a Master's of Education from the University of Virginia. She and her husband, Charlie, reside in Charleston. They have three adult children and one daughter, uh, sorry, two sons and one daughter, and they've been blessed with seven grandchildren, Celia, Charlie, Eliza, Rose, Arch, Macaulay, and Lewis. And uh, I remember when I first met Senator Capito, she was still in the House of Delegates. I was then working for uh, then Commissioner of Agriculture, Gus Douglas. And I said, uh, so tell me about, you know, the woman running for Congress. And he said, always help her, she's the future. And that always stuck with me. And it's a real honor to work for. And without further ado, United States Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Well, thank you, Bill, for that great introduction. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to address you all, as I have many times in the past, during the economic section of this year's conference. Although I can't be with you today in person, please know that I am there with you in spirit. There is no question in my mind that this will be another successful small communities big solutions conference right here at Marshall University. Since we last met, we've started to return to normalcy, thank goodness. We've seen unemployment numbers fall and tourism rise in our state. And it sometimes feel like West Virginia is at the center of the universe. As ranking member of the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee, I was at the center of negotiations with President Biden for the bipartisan infrastructure package. During this time, I was able to secure major wins for West Virginia, including two pieces of legislation I authored and helped pass. These bills are the Surface Transportation Reauthorization Act and the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. These are big bills. The overall package will make historic investments in our roads, our bridges, and our water systems. It will also better connect our state with high-speed wireless broadband and complete vital projects like Quarter H. All of this plays a major role in furthering economic development across West Virginia and gives our communities the tools they need to be successful. Speaking of broadband, one of my main focuses in the Senate has been and continues to be better connecting West Virginia. Over the years, we've made a lot of progress in accomplishing this goal through my Capito Connect program. We're seeing local providers and West Virginians take advantage of opportunities like the FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, or RDOF. We're also seeing an increase in local businesses and communities taking advantage of federal grant programs that support broadband expansion, like those through the USDA's ReConnect program. Connecting West Virginia with wireless, high-speed internet is an absolute priority, and I remain incredibly optimistic about the direction in which our state is heading. Increasing broadband connectivity goes hand in hand with economic development in our state. One of the ways I've been working to spur economic development in West Virginia is through various partnerships like the Economic Development uh, Administration or EDA. Specifically, we work together to increase the level of support our state receives and we've had a great deal of success here. I've also worked to emphasize the natural beauty of our state and outdoor recreational opportunities to increase tourism, that will lead to further economic development. We were able to score a major win at the end of 2020 when our very own New River Gorge was redesignated as our country's 63rd National Park. I have also continued my West Virginia Girls Rise Up program throughout the past year and look forward to future opportunities to connect with and inspire that next generation of female leaders in our state. As the first female 
uh, ever elected to the United States Senate from West Virginia. This is a major priority for me. So again, I miss being there and thank you for giving me the chance to speak with all of you today. Have a great conference. Please thank Senator Capito for us. Now it's time to welcome our senior Senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin. Senator Manchin prides himself on having an open door policy and an open line of communication to his constituents. He is very accessible and he's always working. Senator Manchin currently serves as the chair of the Senate Energy and Natural, Natural Resources Committee. And he also serves on the Appropriations Committee, the Armed Committee, and the Veterans Affairs Committee. Senator Manchin also has a great team in DC and in West Virginia, and they work very hard for all West Virginians. So now we'll turn over the podium to Senator Manchin. Welcome, Senator. Hey, Sarah, how are we doing? Thank you again for this big solutions conference. Uh, for all, the, all of you who might not know, Sarah worked with me for many, many years uh, in so many different capacities. And uh, I know her ability to put something like this together and they're always successful and I'm always proud and, and so proud of her, but I'm always also privileged to be involved and I appreciate it. To Stephanie Tyree, Executive Director of the West Virginia Community Development Hub, to Brandon Dennison for the Coalfield Development, to Bill Bissett, our dear friend, on behalf of Senator Capito. Uh, you know, West Virginia businesses are feeling the pressure of the post-pandemic economy, rising infl inflation, labor market crunches, and much more. Uh, as we know, Americans and West Virginians are feeling the rising prices and inflation that's hurting their families. I see it every day when I go to the gas pump or I go to the grocery store. I see it the same as all of you. By all, all accounts, this inflation threat is not transitory, which uh, Washington has been telling us for quite some time. I saw the indications this past January and knew it would not be because we had every indication showing what was going to happen in the labor market and also with the jam up as far as the supply chain. Uh, so from the grocery store to the gas pump, uh, as people are feeling the squeeze, uh, Right now, you're seeing Washington can't ignore it any longer. Our debt is nearly $29 trillion. In nine days, we will hit $29 trillion. Nine days. Our debt goes up $4 billion a day. And you hear nobody talking about it. No one seems to be concerned. Let me put it to you this way. If the federal government makes adjustments to slow down inflation, and that adjustment is by raising rates, we're at 0%. If they raise rates just to historically still low at 2%, and just to surround it off to $30 million to make it to make it easier. $30 trillion of debt, 2% rate, we would pay $600 billion a year in interest only. Not reducing the debt, $600 billion. That's all of our discretionary spending. We're going to wipe out this economy. And no one seems to be raising the alarms. Nobody. It is absolutely alarming. And the feds will have to do something to subdue this inflation. And all they have is raising interest rates that stops people and stops people from borrowing and spending at the rate we are right now. Uh, I'm, I think, you know, I've been raising this alarm for quite some time, uh, but we got to be prepared. You have to be prepared for the challenges that I may face without putting more pressure on everyday working Americans and West Virginians. Uh, last week, the House of Representatives finally passed a bipartisan infrastructure deal that we passed in the Senate with 69 votes in August. We had 50 Democrats voted for it and 19 Republicans. And we worked in a bipartisan way. There was a group of 10 of us, five Ds and five Rs, that started this whole program to get a bipartisan deal. We grew that to 11 Ds and 11 Rs, and we finally got it completed. I think West Virginia should be proud. Shelley worked very hard on this. I worked hard on it. We all worked together. We put our state and our country before we did our parties. That's what we're here for, and that's what we should be doing. I also want to thank David McKinley, who had the courage, knowing that the pressure was being put on the House. They wanted him to vote against it. He looked at the bill of $6 billion coming to West Virginia, and he's going to tell people we don't need bridges fixed or roads repaired. We don't need water lines or sewer. We don't need our airports. We don't need any of this. And on top of that, we're going to basically, for the first time, get our, uh, our uh, Internet service high-speed internet? How can someone, I don't know how the other two Congress people can speak on this. 
I want to hear their excuse because it'd have to be an excuse. I know I'm being very hard, but I'm telling you, we've got to put a stop to this politicizing everything that we do and the votes we make is destroying our country and it'll hurt our state. This is really a big deal. I've been here for 11 years now in the Senate and I have never had a bill that's more, I think that'll be more transformative than the bill that we have in front of us that we just passed. We're gonna go sign it today. At three o'clock, there's a signing ceremony to White House. We'll be there. Shelly will be there with me. We'll all be there together. But uh, it's just, uh, it's unbelievable the politics that are being played. Um, we're gonna impact every part of the state, every city in the state, every community in the state, every county in the state is gonna be impacted. It's the largest term jobs bill in decades. It's gonna create good paying long-term jobs for over eight to 10 years. This is, this is funded out from eight for eight to 10 years, depending on the workforce, we're able to get everything up and running and the changes that need to be made. This is where you all come involved, Sarah, the whole group that you have there with you. You all have got to start putting your priorities. What needs the most attention in your areas? Wherever you represent, you should be putting your priority list together. Internet's one of the top things we know, high-speed internet, but also bridges. Some bridges or roads that are bad, need repair. Water lines or sewer systems that aren't working or aren't even installed. These are things we've got a chance to do. I'm trying to get daily rail, rail service for uh, Amtrak into West Virginia. All the things that we're fighting for that opens our state up, our airports get money for the first time. Uh, and let me just tell you about the jobs. I put in the bill because all this came through my, my committee of energy and natural resources. So I made sure that we're gonna pay prevailing wage, pre pre prevailing wage on all of these jobs. That's top notch money. And that's also with a benefit package. It's unbelievable. Uh, we're not playing gimmicks or games with the eight to 10 years. And I can explain that later if you want me to, any questions you might want to ask. But the bottom line is the funding, usually every time we put funding out, the funding is for, the funding is for a 10 year period. So when someone says we're going to spend 1.2 trillion, that's over 10 years. We think it'll take at least eight to 10 years to get all these works completed. Now, the different gimmick is this, when someone tells you they're going to spend 1.75 trillion, that's how much money they're going to raise over 10 years, but they won't tell you how they're going to spend it. Some of the programs only have a one-year life. Some of them have a three-year because they're so expensive. What they're hoping for is that the programs will be so, so supportive and you're sending checks to people that you can't get rid of it. And then basically it goes into the debt financing because we haven't appropriated any more money for it. That's how we get to 29 trillion and beyond. So what we're dealing with right now, to give you an idea of how much money's gone out the door, we have sent $5.4 trillion out the door. 5.4 trillion out the door since the pandemic started last March of 2020. 5.4, we prevented us from going into a financial crisis and a health crisis. We've gotten vaccines at record pace. We never had anything come online this quick for the whole world to benefit by. So we have that ability as Americans. We still have that ability. We're the hope of the world because no one else can do what we do. We just got to make sure that we don't overdo it. So we overcharged the system. We kept doing it under the Republicans and Democrats. It just enough is not enough. And I'm keep saying, my God, take a break. Take a break. Give us a breath. And these are the things we start talking about. But I've never seen the hype that's going on right now why people want more and they need to do more and this and that and everything. We need to get back to work. We need to make sure that we take care of our families, but we need to make sure that America keeps moving. And that's what we've uh, kind of lost sight from. This is going to be the largest investment in clean drinking water and wastewater uh, in, for, in American history, in the history of our country. We've never done this much. It'll be the largest dedicated bridge investment since the construction of the interstate highway system in the 50s under Eisenhower. It'll be the largest investment in clean energy technologies, transmission and infrastructure in, his, in the history of our country. We've never done this much. And everybody says, oh, we're still supporting fossil coal and gas and all. We're doing it cleaner than any nation on earth. And we're going to continue. I've always said this, you can't eliminate your way to a clean environment. You can innovate your way because technology is the only thing that we have that we can attract other nations to use what we're using. That's what we can do. It'll be the largest federal investment in passenger rail since the creation of Amtrak. And it'll not have been possible without the continuous 
tireless efforts of all my colleagues on both sides, Democrats and Republicans. Remember this, it would not have passed if Republicans hadn't participated, even though all the Democrats, except for six in the House, and the bill would have failed in the House if it wasn't for the David McKinley's and 12 other Republicans that helped the Democrats get it across the line. For that, I am forever grateful. I really am. So I've always said this, a pothole doesn't have a D or an R name on it. You hit that pothole, it'll tear your tire and your car up. Doesn't care whether you're Democrat or Republican. Infrastructure has always been bipartisan, always been bipartisan. Two things that keeps this country and holds us together is that bipartisan support we have for our military to defend our country and the bipartisan spots for infrastructure. And now even infrastructure was challenged and broken down. We have got to grab hold of what we're responsible for, and that's the republic, which we all have ownership in, in this great country, and step forward, what you all are doing right now. That's exactly what it's about. We prove in the Senate can work, and Washington can work, when we compromise, and we work through our difficult stuff. We've always done that. We're putting America first, sending a message that bipartisanship is not dead. Uh, in West Virginia, think about this. We've got 1,545 bridges, more than 3,200 miles of highway in poor condition, and 32% of trains and other transit vehicles in the state are past their use for life. At least there's 258,000 West Virginians that have no access to broadband, none at all. More than 400 public water systems serving one and a half million West Virginian. It's going to require $2 billion in repairs, while 293 public service wastewater systems serving more than 440,000 residents will require at least $12 billion upgrades and extension. Now, we don't have all that, but we sure have enough money to make a difference. This infrastructure package includes funding for broadbands, roads, bridges, clean energy technologies, rail transport, airports, electric grid, water, and wastewater. It's got everything. So I am tickled to death that we have a chance to put the money back in perspective for you, Sarah, and, your, and all the people on the Zoom. If you would take something that you have studied in history that is monumental, in my generation would be World War II. That I wasn't born until 47, but I remember people talking. My parents were all involved in the war. My, my dad and my uncle were in the military and all them. If you take the cost of World War II, to the United States taxpayers, the cost of World War II, and you take the uh, uh, the uh, rebuilding of the Marshall Plan, rebuilding of Europe after the war, that we basically rebuilt Europe to get them back on their feet. If you take those two costs and use today's dollars, what would that cost today? Four point seven trillion. Four point seven trillion to save the world, to save the world from World War II. The Americans did that. And on top of that, then we rebuilt your Marshall Plan, 4.7. We've already put 5.4 out, 5.4 out with a signing today. That's 1.2. Now we're at 6.6. And if they pass another 1.7, 1.7, then you're at 8.384. Never in the history of the world has so much money from a federal treasury commitment that worth that we're just basically a wash in federal dollars. So you can make any conclusion you want, but that puts things in proportion. If all the things they want to do is done. So yeah, I've been very cautious. I think all of you know me that work with me. I watched the, the nickels and dimes very carefully. And I knew one thing, if you don't have your financial house in order, someone's going to pay a horrific price, a horrific price. And it's usually the people that can least afford it. So any gains you might think that were made when inflation hits at 6%, 6.2, and there's no end in sight, it'll wipe away everything that we've done. So I'm concerned, but we have to work together. My biggest, my biggest message to all of you, we have never had so much come to us in West Virginia. Never before. You've already had over $3 billion, $3 billion sent to the state. The federal government has sent to the state directly. The first shot was $1.25 billion to the governor. And it was never intended for the discretion of any governor to have the ability to use it the way they wanted to. So the second tranche that went out, we made sure that the legislature would be involved and we had direct payments to counties and municipalities that was coming through from the state office with no one having any 
dibs on it, if you will, or controls over it. That's where you all come in. How is this money being spent? What's the commitment? What's, what's the transparency? What's the light that's being shed on the money that's already been committed and the money that's going to be committed? That's what we need to know. Are we getting broadband everywhere? Are we connected with people who have had success in putting broadband and getting internet services, whether it's mobile or hardwired? That last mile is the most difficult one, but there shouldn't be a place in West Virginia that's not going to be connected. Think of it this way. If we can, in the 1930s, can, will we have uh, rural electrification? In the 1930s, under Franklin Roosevelt, rural electrification, we were able to wire up every house in America. Can you believe that? Uh, if we could do that in the 1930s, sure as heck, we should be able to get everyone connected in the 21st century. It's what a difference it'll make. And the population loss that we've had, anybody that went through a pandemic would love to have lived here if they could just communicate and make a living. That means they got to have the technology. That should inspire all of us to get this done. And also in your infrastructure, so people have basic drinking water, sanitation, and sewage, and everything else. There is no reason, there is no excuse for us to never get this done or not get this done. The federal government will never do what they just did. We can't. We don't have the resources to continue down this path. So you better make sure you're using it wisely. I'm telling all of you, you make sure you hold the governor, you hold all your state legislative representatives, you hold me, Shelley, and all of our Congress people. Uh, hold us accountable to make sure this money is being spent and invested in the right place, the right way to benefit the most people. That's what has to be done. So this is so appropriate for you all to have this now. What solutions are you looking for? You'll never have more assistance in federal dollars than you have right now. Never in my life, I've been in public office since 1982, never in my life have I seen this infusion of federal dollars. Remember this, the Great Depression in the 1930s, there's a depression for the whole world was under. Not one time have I ever read an article to where Franklin Roosevelt sent a check to anybody, supplemental payments, okay? Now you can take that any way you want to. Does that help the workforce? Does that impede the workforce? or make them more reliable and dependent upon federal government. Any way you want to. We worked our way out of the depression. It took us 12 years. Then we had to crash as far as the financial crash, 2728, took us five years. We worked our way out of it. We never sent checks to anybody. Well, you can say, well, this one here, we came out quicker than any time. We came out in five months. Out of this one last year in 2020, five months. But guess what? We're still pouring the cash to it. And that's the concern I have. So. Uh, my message would be to, to all of you, you know, we have a wonderful state. We have a great state. Everybody that visited our state, I have people telling me all over this country, I can't believe, I can't believe how beautiful your state is. We went over and stayed in the cabin. We did this during the COVID. And they said, we'd love to have been in the state. We, just, we, we didn't find a place and live there, but we still have to participate. And now the new norm is not going to be what it was before the COVID. People are going to be very, very, very mobile. And they're going to be able to work and make a living anywhere they desire. Us being in the hub of five, five hour drive, most of all America, two thirds of the United States population. You're telling me that we're going to lose population. We're losing kids in schools. We're doing all this challenge when we should be growing. That's the solution you're looking for. How do we grow? And what attracts people, not just to come and visit, but to stay. First thing I would do, I would basically pull all the people in your area, whoever you represent, and find out how many people moved to West Virginia. Why'd you move? What reason? And use that. I've always said the best, the best uh, advertisement is the word of mouth. I've always said this. If you go talk to Toyota, you know how when I was governor, we got more people, more businesses to come because they talked to Toyota and Toyota was so happy with our workforce and the way we treated Toyota. So those are the things, but this is the things you all should be doing. Look and find out. The only thing new in this world is a pair of eyes. Everything else has been copied. So find out, why do people move here? Why do they bring their business? Why do people that come and stay? I remember when Bob Bird brought in the FBI Center in Clarksburg. People said, oh, they won't come. They don't want to come. Guess what? They came and they stayed. Okay? It's unbelievable. And we don't, we just don't toot our horn enough of the quality of life, the opportunities. That's what you all, the big solutions are.
basically find out what's worked with a little, uh, with, with like little decisions that people made that turned into something big. That's what you're looking for. You're going to have the support. Just make sure that the money is invested the right way to give you the best results. So, Sarah, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I just, I really appreciate you all taking the time to get together because you know what? We're a state of communities and towns. We're not a state of cities. We're a state of towns and communities. And it's really what made West Virginia. But it also is the uniqueness. To be a five-hour drive from D.C., Baltimore, in the metropolitan area, and to have to go through the traffic I go through just to get to work, and everybody, it's unbelievable. So God bless you all. I wish I was there back with you right now. <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you. Thank you, Senator, for your remarks. I know that we, a lot of us, we, we get to watch you as you're communicating your message and uh, on national media, and you have always been consistent. If you know Joe Manchin, you know that he is fiscally responsible. You were fiscally responsible as governor, and and now as senator, so um, very much so. Now, if you want to submit a question to Senator Manchin, he has time for a few. Please use the Q and A um, uh, section on your Zoom to submit those questions. And as questions are coming in, Senator, I have one. Can you talk a little bit about you? You mentioned earlier how we in communities need to be getting our priorities list. Can you talk about competitive funding opportunities in that infrastructure bill? And what should small communities be doing right now? We're gonna break that down for you. As, as now it's just coming to light now. We sign it today. Once it's signed into law, then the break comes, okay, of how it's going to be. I'm gonna make sure that we break, our, our team will break it down for you, Sarah, and tell you every pot of money and how you can qualify for those pots of money. And then what I want you all to do is go after from the standpoint and the state. Remember this, you know, you still have a lot of the communities that have matching dollars. We've sent money to communities, okay? They'll get their second tranche of money coming up. Can you, can you imagine if they could use and dedicate some of that money that maybe they haven't spent yet, the first tranche they got, they'll get a second tranche next year and dedicate it to a project they want to complete. Not one they want to start, one they can complete. One, they got it. I don't know, do the communities, are they, are, they, are they identifying their highest priorities? Are you asking and pushing them to identify your highest? What, tell me what you need. You need a bus, you need transit, public transit. Do you need internet service? They'll all need that. Do you need basically infrastructure and water and sewer lines? Okay, all these things we need. How about bridges and how about the transportation mode? Are we able to have your roads in good shape and your bridges are all passable? Things of that sort. That, that's once they identify and they should rank them. You can't do everything, but boy, my God, you can make a, you can get some things done that need to be done, but that's, that's going to be the challenge, but we'll break it down and every pot of money, we'll break it down, whether it's going to be in highway money, whether it's going to be in bridge money, whether it's going to be in internet money, uh, connectivity, whether it's going to be in, uh, you know, some of the communities in the state have rail transportation. I'm trying to get Amtrak just to come through on a daily basis. Hell, they pass through us three or four days a week. And we're trying to get that changed and all these things, but we're going to, we're going to make things happen. And a big part of money is going to public transit. People don't have transportation systems and they don't drive or they depend on public transit and they should use public transit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, we've got our first question now. Um, and our first question comes from Gailey Miller, state director of ARP here in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. Senator, we know that you are very concerned about rising prices for West Virginians. For decades, West Virginians have been faced with rising prescription drug prices. In fact, we've seen prices increase between 2015 and 2019 by more than 26%, while wages only increased about 10%. Congress has before it a prescription drug compromise in the Build Back Better bill that will lower the cost for West Virginians and save Medicare. Can you tell us more about the prescription drug deal in Congress and how it will help lower cost? Well, first of all, I have, if, if, there's, if there's two things that we should do if we do nothing else in the Build Back Better is fix the tax code, first of all. The tax breaks that were given in 2017, uh, I thought and voted against that because they were weighted towards the top end of the food chain, the most wealthiest people and wealthiest corporations. We get that and get our house back in order once you get your cash flow back. 
and, and do and but also don't do it in a punishing way do it in in a more competitive way that keeps us a leader in the world we can do that second there is no excuse for us not doing an overhaul of medicare being able to negotiate for lower drug prices they said well they have a formula the formula is so convoluted right now what they're doing certain drugs have been on the market if they have if they're uh exclusivity the protection time they get when they bring a drug to market we're going to be protecting all that until they get their payback and all these types of things there shouldn't have been an, an, an iota of that type of a compromise we should have gone full steam ahead and just go out and negotiate va does the best job of any of our uh, federal agencies in getting lower drug prices medicaid does a pretty good job also but Medicare being thwarted from that, paying the highest prices in the world for the same drugs that are sold for one-tenth of the cost in other parts of the world is ridiculous. So I agree with, with Gaylene that we've got to do it, but we'll see what happens in this. If, even if something happens, and in, 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 this should be a standalone bill, there's no reason why we aren't able as Americans to negotiate. And we're talking about penicillin. That's not a new drug. It's been out forever. It's been out forever. When you talk about insulin, been out forever. These are not new drugs. Why are they gouging us? Why are we allowing it to happen? They're not going back and reinventing the wheel and spending all this cost to re restructure a, a, a product that's been on the market and been successful. Makes no sense. So I'm doing everything I can. Just put the pedal to the metal. Let us go out and negotiate, get the lowest possible prices for our people. Okay, Senator, we have a question from a student at Marsh University. And the question is, who is an administrator that you would like to bring to West Virginia soon and why? Well, I'm going to bring uh, uh, Becerra, Secretary Becerra. Uh, and uh, he and I have been talking and some, uh, the, well, there's many of them that I can bring in. You know, Pete Buttigieg wants to come in, uh, Mayor Pete. We've been talking and everything on seeing some of the infrastructure in a rural area. We have an unusual situation to where we are a close proximity to Washington, D.C., but a very rural state. And they're able to see how this affects some of the policies they're doing. But uh, but Mr. Uh, Secretary Becerra from Department of Home, I mean, uh, DHH, uh, DHHS, and uh, he's basically medical, uh, the opiate addictions that we have. Uh, that we can basically attack in a different way that I think that we can be much more uh, much more successful than what we have been bringing him in. Uh, also, uh, Pete, um, Pete Buttigieg, as far as Secretary Buttigieg, and also another one, uh, uh, Tom Vilsack. You would think, you know, we don't look at ourselves as a big agriculture. We, we do an all, a lot of agriculture in West Virginia, but on a smaller basis. And there's ways we can help these small operations and small farm operations and food to table, our table, yeah, food to table, uh, these type of things here that be much more successful to help people get nutritional food at a very reasonable price. So those are three that I think would really help West Virginia and can be very influential. There was a follow-up question from that same student. Um, can you tell talk a little bit about internships and if um, you're taking interns for, at the state and uh, you know, we're always looking they just need to get to our office uh 304 342-5855 okay and get a hold of ali or any of ours whoever answers ask for ali mitchell and if anyone has an interest in intern then mara mara will send it up here to chris tissue Chris goes through it. We're always looking for West Virginians to come and intern. We always want good West Virginians that want to be involved. But that's the way, 304-342-5855, and get your application in that you have an interest, and it comes up to D.C., and Chris Tissue puts them all together and starts looking and trying to get as many kids as we can, try to accommodate everybody that has an interest. Great, thank you. And then I have another question that, um, is coming from a faculty member um, from Concord University. What can higher education leaders do to help fuel the economy? Well, basically, first of all, wherever you're located, Concord, down in Athens and all that, what type of opportunities, what type of jobs, where's people needing workers? What type of curriculum? Is your curriculum gauged around the jobs you can provide as far as the quality or skill sets that are needed for the jobs that people are in demand for? what type of opportunities do we have to grow jobs in the area? 
I look, first of all, for all of our, you know, we have about a tremendous uh, variety of colleges, four-year baccalaureate degrees all over our state. And then we have community technical schools on top of that. They all should be looking at around their area of how they service, where their students are coming from and making sure that we can help build the economy of West Virginia. All of them get supported by state resources and state funding. So the main goal should be, how do you provide a workforce and the skill sets of a workforce that we can grow West Virginia? I first look around backyards. If you're in the Fairmont area, if you're in basically in the Athens area with Concord down Southern West Virginia or any place else in between, what are the needs? And right now you have people you're probably talking to and uh, that will tell you that they're having a hard time finding uh, workers with the skill sets that are needed for them to continue to grow their business. Well, Senator, thank you so much okay. for your time. We appreciate you very much and everything. We know that you're working hard for West Virginians at each and every day in uh, the state and in D.C. So thank you and um, God bless. Okay, Sarah, we'll keep in touch and God bless to all of you and thank you for what you're doing and thank you for caring about West Virginians. Let me tell you one thing, big solutions, little solutions, any solutions whatsoever, as long as the people are thinking to get ahead and go ahead. And I've always told people this, if you get something for nothing, it usually turns out being nothing. <laughs> okay? Yep. And, and the, you know, people have very little value if something is not, that was for nothing because they have any any uh, any risk or any hard work involved. I don't know. I come from back, uh, back in the day when you had to work. You just have to work. And you have to work in so many different ways today with your mind, with your body, with your hands, with everything you can to survive. The greatest thing we've always had is good, hardworking people. We just don't have enough, Sarah. So we've got to educate and attract more. Okay. Thank I you all. Really agree. You. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. right. Well, we thank both senators um, and what a great congressional br briefing this morning. Um, they are, both of our senators are really working hard for us in Washington, and we sincerely thank them both. Now we're going to switch our focus to a state update. And um, unfortunately, Secretary Mitch Carmichael cannot join us this morning. Um, he had a scheduling conflict last minute, and he apologizes. However, we are going to hear about tourism, and indeed, there is just so much to see and do in the Mountain State, and uh, the Department of Tourism has a very ag aggressive team who uh, are working diligently to promote our state each and every day. Under the leadership of Secretary Chelsea Ruby, they are truly showing the rest of the world just how special the Mountain State truly is. Secretary Ruby, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us a, a statewide tourism update. Of course, can you hear me all right? We can. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. okay, great. I've been doing this for almost two years now, but every time I worry about technical difficulties, so thank you so much for having me. Um, this is always one of the best conferences that I do every year. Um, Sarah, you and your team do a great job of organizing and there's always such a great discussion. Um, so I'm here back again this year to give you all an update on what's happening in tourism in West Virginia. Um, certainly it has been a roller coaster ride um, with the pandemic. Um, a lot has changed. Traveler preferences has changed. Um, the industry itself has changed. Um, hospitality industry was the hardest hit industry in the entire country. Um, we, like the rest of the country, definitely saw a dip um, as people were staying home and not traveling. But I'll tell you that we've seen some really fascinating trends emerge. So what I want to do today is just walk through that with you and give you kind of an idea of where we are now coming out of the pandemic. So I always start with this one. This is what I feel like. I have you all know I have research. I, every year I come in and I've got a bunch of numbers I want to show you, but this is the way I feel right now. There's just so much research about what travelers want, where people are going, and what they're doing that it's hard to make sense of it. But today what I want to do is give you the 10 most important statistics to tourism in our state. So these aren't just big national trends. These are things that we're seeing here, things that apply to each and every community in West Virginia. 
Before I get into that, I will tell you this, and I think this will probably surprise everyone. I believe that tourism in West Virginia is stronger than ever before and has more potential for growth than ever before. And these reasons that I'm gonna go through are gonna tell you why. So the first one, more than 80% of people believe that tourism is a very important economic driver for West Virginia over the next five years. We have unprecedented support for the hospitality and travel industry, all the way from local town councils, mayors, county commissions, um, the state legislature, the governor, the congressional delegation, everyone has this great sense of pride and excitement about tourism in our state. I don't, I have never visited a single town or city or county that isn't saying, what can we do to grow our numbers? How can we get more people? Every single one of our 55 counties has traveler spending, meaning they have travelers who are coming there and putting money into their communities. It varies greatly based on the types of hotels. We have a couple of counties who don't have hotels, but you know what? They now have vacation rentals. So we're seeing spending in every single county. And we have so much excitement that we're just poised for growth. The second thing, 69% of Americans have a renewed appreciation for the great outdoors. We've seen numbers just explode in anything in West Virginia relating to the great outdoors, whether it be ATVs, rafting, hiking, biking, fishing, hunting, all of these things are up exponentially. We expect to see skiing go up this winter too, but we're seeing all, anything related to the great outdoors just have this great, great boom. If there's one positive thing that came out of the pandemic, I'll tell you it's that the great outdoors became a part of our everyday life. If I even think about my own personal life, every weekend my seven-year-old's like, well, where are we gonna go? Are we gonna go on a hike? Are we gonna do something? And I probably shouldn't admit it, but before the pandemic, I mean, we weren't the family who did that every single weekend. We did it a good bit. Um, but now, you know, our kids think that's something that's just expected. That's what we do. That's a part of our daily lives. And so we've seen so many more people fall in love with the outdoors and make it a part of what they do um, that now we're really starting to see some great economic benefit. Number three, the New River Gorge National Park and Preserve is one of the world's greatest places to see in 2021. Time Magazine, excuse me, designated the new park as one of the world's greatest places. Since then, we also had Lonely Planet, which is the national global um, travel leader who writes the books every year, designated us as the number two travel region in the entire world. Number one was Iceland, and I'm okay being behind Iceland. We were ahead of Burgundy, France, and a lot of other really amazing places. We were the only place in the U.S. But I tell you this to tell you, we're becoming the talk of the travel industry and of the world. It's hard to turn on the TV these days and not see things about West Virginia. We're starting to really build that recognition through things like economic development, announcements, tourism. There's just a lot coming out of the state right now that's all very positive. When I took this job four and a half years ago now, maybe five years ago, um, we really did a lot of research to figure out why were people not coming to West Virginia? We thought we would find that they weren't coming because they had bad impressions of the state or that they had misconceptions of the state. But what we found is they really just had no impression. They didn't think about us as a travel and tourism destination, but because we're now the talk of the nation, the talk of the world when it comes to tourism, People are starting to put us on that list. We're starting to be a destination. Number four, enjoying scenic beauty and visiting national parks are among the top trip characteristics for 2021. That's what people want to do. They want to be outdoors. They want to visit parks and public lands. We have one of the best state park systems in the country. We have tremendous national lands um, and we are just well poised for continued growth. The next one, number five, small towns, villages, and rural destinations are among the top trip characteristics. People wanna live like a local. They wanna to go to a small town. They wanna to get into the community. They wanna do the things that we do, but they wanna do it locally. They don't wanna to go to the big destinations anymore. If you look at recovery trends nationwide, you'll see that those bigger cities are really struggling to come back where the small destinations like West Virginia um, are really starting to rise. I go to a lot of travel and tourism shows where we meet with travel writers and tour operators. And I always start by telling them that we don't have a single town in West Virginia with more than 60,000 people. 
and that always catches their attention. I have this whole list of facts that I go through, and that's always the one that people comment on. They think it's just truly amazing that we're an entire state of small mountain towns. The next one, number six, the craving for authentic local people, events, and experiences continue to grow as 84% of Americans say it's important to get to know the local community when visiting somewhere new. Same thing, this is people wanting to get in. They wanna meet us, they want to have that experience. I tell folks all the time that I have the easy job. Our team at the State Tourism Office is working to put out the advertisements that get people interested in West Virginia. But the reason that 87% of people who visit our state come back is because of the locals in the community. It's the people that they meet, the experiences that they have while they're there that keep them coming back. Number seven, this one's kind of a nerdy trend, but I still like it. It's that media consumption has doubled since the pandemic began. Now, what this actually means is that it's given us more opportunities to advertise, that there are more and more places, there's more and more airtime that we can buy. What it also means is that we have to be more creative. People are learning to tune it out. They hear it all the time. If you look at studies on how many ads you hear in a day, you would just be blown away to see the number. So while we have more opportunities, we've also got to make sure we're more clever. One thing that I think has been really telling about the pandemic is when we all started turning our advertising back on. I work a lot with the state directors in the other states. And so we had several calls where we all talked about what was the messaging going to be? What was, you know, were we going to have masks and ads? What, what were these ads going to look like? And I'll tell you, while the other states all scrambled to put together new ad campaigns and to create new things that really appealed to these post-pandemic travelers, we didn't change a thing. We went back and looked at the commercials we had for that summer before, and we started running them because they had all these things I'm talking about. It was wide open spaces. We had small mountain towns. We had outdoor recreation. We had all the things people wanted, and it was our product before the pandemic. So it's been really great to be able to put that messaging out there. It performs so well. We see time and time again, our best performing ads are things just like what's on the screen here. Scenes that show people being able to get out and you know explore the great outdoors, but do it in a crowd-free way. Number eight, rural nights booked off of Airbnb increased 180% from 2015 to 2021. I will tell you that our increase in West Virginia is even greater than that. Um, we have worked hard with the industry, the travel and tourism industry in West Virginia over the last couple of years to get some legislative changes made to start collecting the occupancy tax on um, vacation rentals. That has been very successful. That goes into effect in January. We are collecting the sales tax on it. So I'm able to see the revenue and see how much it's going in. And you wouldn't believe the amount. Just in the month of September, taxable sales from vacation rentals in West Virginia topped $8 million. Going back two years ago, we were looking at about $2 million a month. So we're really growing quickly, quickly, quickly um, in this, both on the supply and demand side. It's something that we're watching really closely. I'm here today at our annual conference um, with the tourism industry, and that's one of the main things that we're talking about. How do we bring them into the fold? Our strategy for years and years has been to work with hotels, but now we've got to figure out how do we bring in these vacation rentals? If you think about somebody coming in from Washington, DC, like I did before I moved here and staying in a vacation rental, like I did before I moved here, they drive all the way here. They might get to a place, let's say in Tucker County in a beautiful remote place. Um, they don't have a lot of cell service. They can't figure out where to go eat. They don't know where they are. And we've got to make sure that in all those vacation rentals, we have vacation guides, that we have materials, we have lists of restaurants, we have all the things that they need to really get out and explore, explore the area around them. So that's something we're really going to be working on over the next year. Number nine, most international markets are expected to rebound by 2024 or 2025, and Canada will bounce back even more quickly. So you may not realize this, but the tourism department does actually advertise um, internationally. We have nine regions now that we focus on. Um, with the pandemic, we put everything on pause when the borders were closed, um, but we are now starting to turn those ads back on. We are focusing, focusing the majority of our energy on Canada right now, but we will be layering in those other markets. This is an area where I believe we have a tremendous amount of potential. We have not cracked the code on this. 
we are still very, very low in international visitation. But if you look at the states around us, what you'll see is that they all have more and they're growing. These international travelers, they come, they stay three to four weeks, and they're going to all the states around us, but they're not stopping in the mountain states. So we're working very hard. I'll be going to a conference to meet with about 80 tour operator, operators the week after Thanksgiving, but this is something that we're really focusing on. So I hope you start seeing more and more international visitors in your communities um, in the coming years, but this is something, it's a long-term strategy. Um, these people stay longer when they come, but they also book much further in advance. So even if we really start working on it hard this fall, like we're going to in this winter, it will be probably a year before we start seeing results, but it's something that we're really excited about. Um, we put a lot of emphasis into it right before the pandemic, um, but I'm not going to be discouraged. We're going to pick it back up and see where to go from here. Number nine, 68% of Americans believe travel brings joy to their lives. So we are gonna be releasing tomorrow some research that we had done. It was proprietary research that we just had done um, where we surveyed US travelers to ask them about their New Year's resolutions for next year's. We found some really interesting stuff in the survey results. We found that people are valuing experiences more than material things coming out of the pandemic. We found that people want more time with their family. We found that people want to travel. So we're going to be launching a campaign that's aimed in our target out-of-state markets, where we are going to be inviting people to West Virginia to jumpstart their New Year's resolutions. So whether it's to be more active, to spend more time with your family, whatever it might be, we've got an itinerary for you in West Virginia that lets you put those resolutions into action. So it'll actually be a contest where people go, it's called Resolution X where they're gonna go and they're going to um, get on our website and tell us what their resolutions are and we will help them find a way to fulfill that in West Virginia. I'm excited about it. You guys know I love research and love digging into these things. I think it's a real opportunity as people think about the new year, they think about these resolutions and they think about how they wanna prioritize for 2022. Um, we've got an opportunity to continue putting that West Virginia message out. The more and more we can do that through various things, um, the better we will be. So I go back to what I told you at the very beginning, which is West Virginia tourism is stronger than ever and has unprecedented potential for growth. I believe this more than ever before. We see these numbers growing. We still have some things to, um, to rebound from, from the pandemic. We're still not seeing as much meeting and conventions business as we have in past years, but that's slowly starting to pick up. And we're seeing this tremendous, tremendous um, input of people from larger markets who just want to escape. They want to go to a park where they can spread out, where their kids can run and play. You know, before I moved here, my husband and I lived in DC and we used to go on the weekend to a little park in Alexandria. And I remember we would, we would often get lunch and go to that park and we would sit um, and wait for a little spot of grass to open up so we could go have our lunch. And my have things changed now, you know, fast forward 11 years, um, we live here in West Virginia. We've got two small kids. Um, there's a waterfall behind our backyard. Um, we can go on hikes every weekend. I have a five minute commute. Um, all of these things just make West Virginia an unbelievable place to visit. So if anybody has any questions, I'm always available. Um, my email address is right here on the screen. It's also on our website. My phone number is there too. I'm very easy to find. But the message that I really hope you all take away from today is this tremendous level of excitement about the industry. There is a ton of potential for each and every one of you. You might be thinking, my community's small. We don't have attractions. We don't have hotels. I'm here to tell you, you have natural beauty. And so please work with us. Please reach out. Let me see what our team can do to help you. We have a lot of resources, a lot of programs um, to help you kickstart that tourism growth in your community. But again, thank you for having me, Sarah, you and your team do a great job and I always look forward to this. Well, thank you, Secretary. Um, we appreciate you very much. You always come prepared with the latest trends to share and want great information. And it really helps us in small communities, you know, to try to find jobs and development and, and gain access um, and show people, you know, our niche and how special we are and to put our best face forward, if you will. Um, 
real quick, um, what could higher education officials do to help the tourism uh, industry? Is there something that we need to be doing, offering through programming, certifications, you know, working with our communities? Is there something uh, that you need from us? Yeah, so we would love to partner with all of our institutions of higher ed in the state. Um, if we look at job projections right now, depending on how you look at hospitality and travel jobs and how broad your definition is, you have anywhere between 45,000 and 75,000 with that broader definition of people who are in this industry in the state. The projections show that we could grow as many as 9,000 new jobs per year each year for the next four years. Today, we are only graduating about 200 majors or minors in this state in the industry. So we've really got to look at how can we create additional programs? How can we create additional tracks? I think there was a big push years ago to look at, let's create all these hospitality majors. But I think now what we're finding is that people really prefer the minors. They want to major in business degrees and do a minor in hospitality. They want to major in finance and do a minor in revenue management vice versa. There's a lot of things. Um, there are jobs at that four-year level, but then there's also a lot of jobs um, in this industry that pay very well where you can go and get an education from one of our community and technical colleges. So we're working with the U.S. Um, Economic Development Authority on potentially getting some funding to roll out a big program where we can both help work to set up new programs at our colleges and universities, but also make them more accessible through programs like our Learn and Earn and other things that have proven to be very, very fruitful in the state. How can we fight back on the stereotype, the stigma that outdoor recreation is only a three-month job? You know, it's people think that I, a lot of times, and this Ever since I've been in this job, one of the challenges is that anytime we talk about jobs, people think that they are minimum wage jobs that are just seasonal. But if you actually look at the numbers, the majority of those jobs pay $50,000 or more. There are some seasonal jobs, absolutely. And those jobs are really important, but there are a lot more of these higher level jobs in the industry that people don't know about. And I'll tell you that if you look at the state of West Virginia and the resorts that we have scattered around, I don't think, and I might be wrong, but I, the majority at least of the people who are running those resorts have been brought in from other states because we just aren't getting enough people through the education system here in West Virginia with a desire to learn about hospitality and tourism. Now on the bright side of all of that, I will tell you that here at this conference, and just before I logged in, the governor just left and he was here meeting with 82 high school students um, who are working through the Department of Education's HEAT program and are studying hospitality and travel through their high schools with the community and technical colleges. These kids are so excited. One of them even came and asked for their picture with me, which just made me laugh. Like, I'm nobody. I don't know why you need your picture with me. Go take a picture with baby dog. But that's how excited they are. They're so excited about the future of this industry and they're excited to be here today. So I think it's bright. We're getting more people interested, um, but we're really going to need to build more relationships with our institutions for higher learning. That's great. And you mentioned, you know, international travel um, and Canada in particular. Well, in, you can go, especially in the summer, on interstate uh, and you can always see the cars and there are so many cars coming from Canada. And, I mean, just to get them to extend their their trip by one day, one night, that would be, that would make a huge impact on our state revenue and, and the tourism industry. So Absolutely. I, We've got to get them to stop. I don't even need them to spend the night. The first time they can just stop and eat and do something. Um, so you've probably seen the work that we've been where we've wrapped all the booths um, to be different scenes, different activities, different seasons. Um, we've also put a lot more signage on the turnpike relating to the newest national park. That's an effort that needs to expand across the state. We need more signage. We need more information for all these people passing through. I've run the numbers before. Um, just if we can get 1% of every car that's passing through the state to stop, it would grow our numbers exponentially. So that's certainly um, one of our areas of focus. We've also been working with a number of trucking companies around the state to actually get them to wrap their trucks. Um, so that there's trucks on the roadways in West Virginia and in the surrounding states 
with these beautiful tourism images. So shout out to the Beer Wholesalers Association who's helped us on that, Mr. B's. There have been all kinds of people who've stepped up and said, hey, we'll give you the side of our truck. We'd love to help promote West Virginia. And that's an important part of it too. You know, it takes all of us joining together and talking about West Virginia and promoting that positive impression. Yeah, no, I completely agree. We all have to be ambassadors, right? We, um, and this is what this conference is all about, to celebrate what's working well. And we have a beautiful state and we have beautiful people. Um, and I just think that you've done a great job. One final question, as we look toward developing more West Virginia solutions, is there, is there a sector in outdoor recreation? Is there something that we're missing? Do we need more restaurants? Do we need more, you know, uh, bike rentals, ATV rentals, um, ATV repairs shop, or is it just all the above? We just need more of everything. Yeah, so with our increased visitation over the last three years, I would tell you that we need to continue growing in all areas, and we're seeing that. We've got about six hotels that are going under construction. Um, we have more Airbnbs coming online and vacation rentals every single month. We have new kayak rental places. We've got a lot of new growth. When I started, about 20% of my job was development and 80% marketing. Today, I would tell you it's the reverse. I spend 80% of my talking or my time talking to folks who are interested in investing in West Virginia this year. So it's a combination. It's both. Um, but if there's one thing I would tell you we need to do, it's to actually be more coordinated. So a lot of you here have probably heard me say this again, but I'm going to say it one more time because I think it's an important point. If you go on vacation in Myrtle Beach or Washington, D.C. or New York City, you're going to go and stay for a week. And chances are in that week, you're not going to go more than about a 10 mile, 20 mile radius. You're going to stay right there. You're going to eat all your meals there, shop and do everything. In West Virginia, we have enough for you to do for two, three weeks. We've got plenty to do, but it might mean jogging from one place to another. It might be crossing a county line, going from one region to the other. It's gonna be a beautiful scenic drive, but we've gotta connect those dots for people. We've gotta tell them that just an hour from here, you can find X, and just 30 minutes from here, you can find Y. We have to do a better job of working together and promoting regions in West Virginia instead of just specific destinations. We're a little bit um, disadvantaged just because of the way the funding in West Virginia works. The hotel tax is collected on a county basis, which means that that's the way our promotion is organized. And so we've really been working together with our convention and visitors bureaus, our hotels, our attractions to try to um, bring them together to advertise not just X county or Y city, but this destination where you can come. So kind of a long answer, but a little bit of both, but the main thing is coordination and collaboration, which I know is what today is about. So thank you guys for being forward thinking and everything that you do. Again, don't ever hesitate to reach out. I am so happy to sit down and talk with groups from communities across the state and see how can we help you and what services we can provide. Well, thank you, Secretary, for that very informative conversation. It's always wonderful to host you, and you keep up the great work. Keep on keeping on. Thank you. <laughs> Everyone have a great one. Well, thank you so much. And we appreciate that update from our tourism office. And we have, a, we're running actually a, a few minutes ahead of schedule and so we're going to take um well actually i think we're ready to go with our next um fireside chat so now we'll turn it over to our featured presentation a fireside chat style conversation between the west virginia department of economic development executive director mike graney and our very own brad d smith to say I'm a little excited about this conversation would be a complete understatement. In fact, this conversation has been booked for months, but with the recent development of Mr. Smith being named Marsh University's next president, well, there's just great excitement um, in this region of the state, and we have so much more to talk about.
So I'm going to hand the conversation over to Director Mike Greeny, um, who will say a few words and officially um, introduce Brad and get the conversation started. But I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say some words about Director Greeny. If you know Mike, then you know that he is always working. He is always collaborating and developing partnerships and projects to strengthen our state. Before this appointment by Governor Jim Justice, Mike spent much of his professional career in executive or co-founder positions with companies related to the petroleum industry. In those roles, he was responsible for managing different facets of business, including acquisition, maintenance, construction, finance, administration, retail operations, and environmental compliance. So he understands industry needs and what it takes to keep our economy moving in the right direction. And he understands how important economic development is to the Mountain State. Director Graney, it's always so nice to see you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today and to help facilitate this conversation. Thank you. Well, Sarah, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I appreciate those comments. Um, before I introduce the man who actually needs no introduction, um, I want you to note the color of my attire today, okay? <laughs> and, um, I love I it. Want, I also want to do a brief um, sort of shout out for the governor's proclamation because this week is National Apprenticeship Week. Um, 15th through the 21st. And I'm not going to read the entire proclamation. That would take some time. But I do want to note two quick Whereas, whereas apprenticeship programs are vital components of talent development strategies in many high demand and high growth sectors and are recognized as a critical post-secondary education training and employment option, and whereas apprenticeship programs enhance economic vitality and lead to a stronger economic environment by producing highly skilled and competitive workers and providing workers with skills versatility and credentials recognized nationally and often globally. And so apprenticeships are a vital part of our economy and we need to continue to grow apprenticeships throughout all sectors of the state. So enough of my commercial. I promise to do that for you, Dave Rogers. There you are. Um, Dave runs our Governor's Guaranteed Workforce Training Program in the Development Office. So as you know, Brad Smith really needs no introduction. Fortune 500 board director, former CEO, leadership coach, philanthropist, and now president-elect of Marshall University. Brad, you've been incredibly generous with your talent, your treasure, and now your time. And so we are grateful to you. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you and Elise and thank you and your daughters for making this incredible commitment to Marshall University and to the state of West Virginia. I can only tell you, I am so thrilled to be able to work with you in the past and going forward, my um, expectations are high. So I think West Virginia is in a perfect position to develop our economy. And with that, um, I'd like to um, offer up a couple of questions for uh, you to uh, take on. And so, uh, Again, thanks for being with us today, and thank you for everything you've done for our state and will do for our state. <laughs> First of all, Director Graney and Sarah, I want to thank you both for the warm welcome and for the kind invitation. And I can tell you one of the great benefits of Marshall University and the role it plays in the state is our first name is we. We are Marshall, so anything I contribute will be a part of a larger team effort, and I'm very excited to lean in and do just that. So thanks for having me today. Fantastic. Well, Brad, um, I know one of your passions centers around um, the Ascend West Virginia program. And what can you tell us about what's happened with the Ascend West Virginia program since its inception and the progress that has been made? Well, Mike, I'm glad you started with that question because it is a great example of teamwork. It's a partnership between our foundation, so private industry. It's a partnership with WVU and with the State Department of Tourism and Secretary Chelsea Ruby and her team. And it's amazing. So I'll break it into three pieces. I'll talk a little bit about what the program is, why we created it, and then some of the results today. 
So the program is the nation's premier talent recruitment program, and it invites people who are fully employed but have the permission to live anywhere that they want to choose West Virginia as their forever home. And it offers $12,000 in relocation and retention incentives. It gives these individuals one year's worth of free access to outdoor activities, and it gives them access to a state-of-the-art co-working facility where they can work with fellow ascenders, as they call themselves, from different companies from all over the world, and they form a bond with each other and with the community. Now, why we launched it is because it tackles historical strategic challenges that our state has fought with capitalizing on emerging secular trends. So the strategic challenges we know all too well, which is the difficulty in attracting large employers to move into our mountainous state and bring hundreds, if not thousands of jobs. And because we don't have so many of those opportunities, we've had brain drain over 50 years where our youth feel the need or the choice to leave the state to pursue a career. So those are the challenges. And remote work actually flips that narrative in our favor because of two things, the rise of remote work, which is now going to be roughly 40% of the population in the United States will be able to work remotely coming out of COVID. And the second is a shift in geographic preference. Rural has become the new urban. And so what used to be our mountains and rivers and streams were these big barriers and walls. Well, now they're welcome signs to this next generation who would love to live in a place where they can live, work, and play. So we launched the program um, on the 50th anniversary of John Denver's release of his iconic song, Country Roads. And I will tell you, as you probably know, our goal is to have 1,000 remote workers over the next five years through a series of host cities. But our strategy day one was 55 counties strong. While we may have host cities, we've been telling a West Virginia narrative and we've been working with the local economic development groups in each of the towns and communities throughout our state to help them benefit and get ready to welcome these ascenders into their corner of the state. So we have a thousand that we hope to have plus their families. Right now for every ascender, every remote worker we bring in, they're bringing 2.1 people. So they're bringing their trailing spouse, their partner, sometimes their kids. So we opened up the first 75 positions, 50 in Morgantown, 25 now in Lewisburg, Shepherdstown will open up applications probably in the spring. For those 75 initial positions out of the 1,000 we hope to bring in, we've had almost 400,000 people visit the website, over 11,000 applications, the average income for the remote worker alone is north of $105,000, not counting what their trailing spouse or any other family members will make. And so what's happening is individuals are choosing our state. They're bringing with them their jobs, their talents, their family, their purchasing power. They'll spend in our local small businesses. Their income will be taxed, which will help our K through 12 system and our broadband connectivity and all the things we need from an infrastructure perspective. And the math on this, Mike, and I'll wrap it up, is the conservative estimates is if we're only half as good as the other remote worker programs, it is hundreds of millions of dollars to our state. So far, our numbers are exceeding every other program, so I think this will be much larger than that. Brad, fantastic. And one thing that impresses me about this is it's so strategically well thought out and brings so many different components together and delivers such a great message. You're moving the needle. I'm grateful to you. One of the things the development office is actually struggling with is determining those number of folks who have moved back here or have moved to West Virginia to relocate permanently. It's hard for us to actually get data and access to that information. And so this program actually does that very well. And so I'm grateful to you for it. Um, let's keep moving, um, and it ties into a little bit of what you talked about already, working with other smaller communities. How do you believe West Virginians can help build stronger communities? Well, I think it starts first with just who we are and how we're raised. Uh, we are a hospitable group of citizens. Um, we're charitable. We always serve our neighbors before we serve ourselves, and that's what people are looking for, especially today where there's a lack of civil discourse in society. They want people that are welcoming, that are helpful, that are courteous, that care deeply about others. And so we already have a strong foundation. But then when you study what the Bloomberg Foundation has done to figure out how to help vibrant communities grow, or you study those remote worker programs that we learned from across the nation, there are four things that communities have to have in place if they want to truly benefit from an economic boom. The first is called essentials. 
Essentials are a good K through 12 education system, healthcare, affordable housing, and broadband. Broadband is the new interstate highway. So we need to make sure all of our communities are set up so that they have those things as the essentials, the fundamental foundation in place. The second thing is the community needs to make sure it has a vibrant downtown. It doesn't matter how big your downtown is, but it does matter that it has an arts and crafts scene, that it has some sort of community themed events where everyone comes out and visits downtown, a diversity of restaurants and some public spaces. And those public spaces can be walking trails, biking trails, or just good sidewalks. So those were the second thing, which we call vibrance of community. The third is important to have something distinctive. So whether it's Canova and the Pumpkin House, or it's the Mothman, or it's the Hatfield and McCoy Trail, or it's Seneca Rocks, all of our communities need to find the thing that makes them special and different from anywhere else and be proud and celebrate that. And then last but not least is what I started with, the intangibles. Diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a choice. These people are coming from all over the world. When I mentioned people who had visited the website on 11,000 applications, I failed to mention they came from 50 states and 77 countries. These individuals will come from different races, different political and religious beliefs, different sexual orientations, and they want to move into a place where they know that their differences are welcomed and they can be authentic to who they are. And we're very good in West Virginia in appreciating everyone's differences. And that's the important piece that I think we have playing in our favor. You know, Brad, every time I have the opportunity to speak with you, I, I learn something new. You put the message together so well, and I'm so appreciative of that. And um, I'm just going to have to spend more time with you so I can learn more. Well, um, Mike, I, I learn from you all the time. You're, you humble me, but you know, I get a lot more from you than I give back. But I can't wait to spend more time together. I'm looking forward to this next chapter. Absolutely. Thank you. So here's one that we've been wrestling with for some time, and, um, and it's an important one. What's the best way to solve our college graduates leaving our great state to find work elsewhere? And what's the best way for us to attract new industries to West Virginia? Help me figure out how to do my job. <laughs> Oh, Mike, you're doing your job fantastically well, and it's been great to partner with you. I'll start with the how do we keep our youth in the state? And I think there are a few things that we've learned from others, and I think we can appreciate will be something that we're already working on inside the state. The first is to bring them jobs. The second is to teach them how to create jobs. The third is to inspire a sense of pride in the state they live in. And then the fourth is to provide them resources. So to bring them jobs, this is becoming easier now. Remote work is coming to them. They don't have to leave West Virginia to go to New York or to Washington or to Pittsburgh or to California or to Texas anymore because these jobs are coming here. So we have to make sure we're being a very remote work friendly state so that they can participate in any of the careers they want right here in West Virginia. That also includes internships and other co-curricular uh, co activities. So that's the first is bring them jobs. The second is teach them how to create jobs. Right now, entrepreneurial pursuits create 80% of all net new jobs in the world. And in West Virginia, it's even higher. Small business owners are the backbone of the economy and startups are the reasons why jobs grow. So we have to make sure that every one of our K through 12 schools in their CTE programs, as well as all of our two year and four year colleges and universities are teaching design thinking and entrepreneurial skills so that these young men and women graduate and they can create jobs right here in West Virginia. The third is we have to inspire in them a sense of pride. And this is where I'm excited about the program we're working with West Virginia University on. It's called Science Adventure School, where we teach middle school kids in West Virginia STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, learning through outdoor activities, how a zip line is actually physics or how a BMX bike actually works using science. But they get to do it at the Bechtel Summit Reserve and out on some of our bike trails. And so they fall in love with parts of the state they didn't even know were here. And so they, all of a sudden they say, wow, I can learn this stuff and I love where I live. And then the last is making sure we have resources for them. So if they do choose to do a startup, making sure we give them access to funding and mentorship. And those are the opportunities we have. Now, on the flip side, you asked about how to bring industries here. And it's pretty much a similar process. Companies follow talent. And so if you start to attract remote workers here and then they tell their friends, this is a great place to live. 
then all of a sudden the company started to say, why are all of my employees wanting to live in West Virginia? Maybe I should open a satellite office there. So as long as we're cultivating and growing great talent and we're welcoming and attracting in remote talent, the businesses will follow, trust me, as will the investors. Sarah, I hope you're recording this. I mean, that's a perfect answer. Exactly what we all need to be focused on. And, you know, as I've only been on the job for three years, I will tell you, it's been fascinating. And the folks who have been with the development office for a long time will tell you that the development office has never been as busy as it is right now with new inquiries, with expansions, with support, um, with, with, you know, looks that we previously had not gotten before. So, you know, West Virginia actually is um, really kind of on fire from that perspective. And we've got a couple of big, big whales on the hook, so to speak, but we're also helped building up that smaller entrepreneurial piece and the efforts associated with that through the SBDC business link program and a number of other things. You nailed it when you said access to capital for small business and startups is critical. So yes. thank you for that. Um, all right, let's go to the next question. Uh, do higher education institutions have a role in state and regional economic development? If so, what can two-year and four-year institutions do to enhance development and job creation? And I know you just answered part of that question, but maybe you could expand on that a bit. Thank you. Yeah, I can, Mike, and I don't say this with any bias because of the new role I'm coming into. In fact, as you know, our family foundation focused on education, entrepreneurship, and the environment because those are the three catalyzing factors to driving economic growth. We've studied the world for the last 20 years and studied the best and the largest foundations, and those are the things they focus on. And so education is absolutely a critical player, our K through 12, our two-year and four-year colleges and universities, because we live in a world now where the knowledge doubling curve is accelerating. And if people aren't familiar with that, the knowledge doubling curve is an algorithm that predicts how long it takes for all of human knowledge in the world to double. In the year 1900, it took 100 years. In the decade of 2020, it's on pace to double every 12 hours. In fact, 90% of all the world's information that exists today was created in the last 24 months. What does that mean? That means education is critical in all forms, VOTEC, CTC, two-year, four-year degrees, micro-credentials, stackable credits, adult learning, because we're all in a job now where it's going to change so quickly that we have to keep up and we have to continue to learn. So we play a critical role, and I think it puts the onus on all the educators to think about three things, and this is what I shared when I was interviewing for the Marshall role. I think it's important that we have to have in-demand knowledge delivered with on-demand access and then choose where each of our universities and colleges will be distinctive from each other. In-demand knowledge means we need to make sure that we're training and educating our youth for the skills that they will need in the 21st century. Now, these skills include liberal arts and great teachers and all the things we know are foundational to society, but it also includes things like cybersecurity or biomedical or sustainable agriculture. And so those are the things we have to make sure we're adjusting our curriculum to do, in-demand knowledge. The second is on-demand access. We live in a digital world now. Students wanna learn in a classroom, they wanna learn online, they wanna learn at their employer site. Walmart, Target, Chipotle, Amazon have all announced full tuition reimbursement for any of their employees that wanna get back and get their two and four year degree. The only thing is you have to be able to offer it online because we're not going to let them relocate and take four years off to go to school. And so we have to make sure our universities and colleges are offering our curriculum online. And then distinctive is we don't need 16 of the exact same university in the state. Each one of us need to know where we're going to be specialized and different so that we can together come together and kind of play the orchestra. So those are the things that I think we are, but we should be and can be and are the economic driver of the future because we live in a knowledge world now and we need to continue to train that knowledge, but we have to think about it with in-demand knowledge, on-demand access and where we wanna be distinctive. Brad, that's so well said. It's, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it almost takes my breath away to hear you talk about that. And now really it's up to us to execute that strategy because it's so spot on. Um, you've also already answered a little bit of this question, but 
let's take it from a different angle. What advice would you give municipalities and small communities in the quest to attract new jobs to their region? Yeah, Mike, this is a great answer, and I'm glad you asked it from a different perspective because I talked about what the essentials are and what the uh, vibrancy of downtowns need to be, and then ultimately, how do you make sure you're being distinctive? I'm going to narrow in on the distinctive piece because it's very similar to how high tech chooses to innovate. It's how the iPhone was created or how Jeff Bezos created the Amazon platform that it is today. There's three things that economic development and business development share in common. The first is you have to be really clear what the problem is you wanna solve or what the vision is you want to be. So this is called the grand challenge. What do you wanna be known for? What do you wanna go out and be after or chasing? So that's the first. Then the second is, how do you have a reason to believe that you're going to be able to achieve that? So show some proof that you're already doing that. You can deliver against that vision. So this is called find a big opportunity that you know you can deliver. And then the third is choose where you're going to be distinctive. So a wonderful example, just to bring it to life, would be the Hatfield and McCoy Trail. So one of the things is we know right now millennials and the Gen Z love outdoor recreation. They love the mountains, they love being outdoor, and they love history. Well, we have this beautiful topography in the southern part of our state. And we have the Apple and the Apple McCoy Trail. And then the second is prove we can do it well. Well, we can do it well because we have RT, we have ATVs and we have the opportunity to have trails out there. And so we can do something no one else can do. But then the third is distinctive. Well, God only created so many mountains and valleys and streams. There's only one Hatfield and McCoy area. So no one else in Colorado can say, no, we're the Hatfield and McCoy Trail because that belongs to West Virginia. So just think about how your community does that. And I gave examples earlier, you know, the Pumpkin House and Canova, the Mothman, um, any of these things, Seneca Rocks, just say, this is what we're going to be known for. Here are reasons to show you that we can do this. And this is what's going to make us unique from anywhere else. And if you really harness your energy against that, you will be successful. And I'll finish with this last point, Mike. You've heard me say this before. Very seldom do efforts fail because of starvation. They fail because of indigestion. In other words, if you choose to do few things better, you will be more successful than trying to do too many things poorly. So well said, thank you. So, you know, it's interesting. One of the things I've learned in the past three years is that we are moving forward as a state to collaborate, cooperate, and communicate. And that's so incredibly important. The, the second piece, I think, and actually um, you've mentioned this before and, and Chelsea Ruby, Secretary Chelsea Ruby mentioned it just moments ago, regionalism and working together regionally um, will be very, very important going forward. Um, yes. So again, partially answered this question, but um, what else should West Virginia be doing to make entrepreneurship a possibility for people in our state. And we've talked about access to capital, but really getting the message out to, you know, sixth graders about the possibilities they have in front of them. Uh, you've talked before about the fact that many college graduates want to work for themselves. And so what else, what else can we be doing to help with that? Yeah, this is our opportunity, and this fits into a larger narrative that we've all been talking about. John Chambers and WVU and Ray Lane and ourselves at Marshall and all the community colleges and working with President Marty Roth at the University of Charleston. I mean, everyone's leaned in and we've dubbed it the startup state. And we have studied other geographies that have very similar histories and very similar topographies as ours. And they've reinvented themselves. And they've all done it by doing exactly this, which is how do we teach people how to create jobs, not just go look for jobs. And there's one core fundamental piece that we need to do. We need to make sure that design thinking is taught in all of our schools in the state of West Virginia. You can begin as early as middle school. You can make it a part of your grades 10 through 12. You can make it the core focus of your CTE program. And it should be in every freshman class in a community college and in a two and four year university. And I will tell you what design thinking is in a headline. It was coined by Stanford University. They actually developed a Stanford D school or design school, and it has three pieces. The first is it teaches you how to fall in love with the problem and not an idea, because 90% of all ideas fail. But you have to have the ability to stay in love with the problem and be stubborn on the vision. So how do you really get deep and understand the problem and write a problem statement? 
Then the second is go broad to go narrow. This was learned from Japan, the Toyota production system. You force the entrepreneur to have at least seven different ideas to solve the problem. It's called seven to one. That way they don't fall in love with an idea. They fall in love with the problem and they come up with seven different ideas. And then the third step is run rapid experiments. Because as we talk a little bit later, I'm sure, um, you'll find out that investors don't typically invest in a business plan. They invest in a talented entrepreneur and some in-market evidence that was conducted through some scrappy experiment that said, wow, customers really do like this. So that is design thinking. And what it teaches all of our kids to do is to really just get stubborn on the vision, come up with all kinds of ways to solve it, and then get busy doing, not talking, not spreadsheeting, not PowerPointing, but actually build something scrappy. And then once you have that, plug into one of our incubators in our universities and colleges and get their coaching and mentorship to get your idea funded. And you will, because investors are dying to put their money into something that's already proven to work. And that's what a rapid scrappy experiment will do. So that's what I would encourage us to do. Design thinking in all of our schools, then plug into our incubators and accelerators and the funding will come. Fantastic answer. You know, I'd still sort of ref refer to myself as a recovering entrepreneur. So this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. And, you know, what I know about design thinking to this point is that it actually can help develop passion and sort of fire in the belly, yes. which are two diff two things that are difficult to sort of, you know, teach from a, from a classroom textbook. So um, it's brilliant and I appreciate it. So, um, Here's one last question for you. Actually, I've got one final question, but you know, now that you've taken this newly appointed position as president of Marshall University, what do you envision for the future of West Virginia? And you know, what can we all you know stand around to help accomplish that vision? Yeah, I envision playing a part along with a larger group of people that are already doing amazing work to make sure that we prepare our next generation to participate in the 21st century. And that's through a combination of design thinking, in-demand knowledge in all of our schools, giving them the confidence to believe that they can participate. So that's the first. The second is I wanna make sure we have broadband in every house and holler. That is the new utility that everything depends on, whether it's telehealth, whether it's the ability to start a business, whether it's the ability to actually be a remote worker and live in our state, it goes on and on and on. We have got to get broadband connectivity ubiquitous throughout the state. The third is I'm looking forward to seeing a diversified and strong economy. And that'll be through a combination of remote work, a combination of startups, a combination of us leaning into some of these new opportunities that are starting to emerge. And then last but not least, I wanna see our sense of pride come back. For too many years, our narrative has been shaped by either stories told about us or some of the tragedies we've had to work our way through like opioid addiction or some of these reality TV shows where someone gets 15 minutes of fame but they don't always represent the best side of who we are. Well, I wanna see our pride come back because we are the dreamers and the doers. We mined the coal that forged the steel that built this nation, that armed our forces, that landed a man on the moon and got him back to earth through the hidden figures and through the rocket boys. That's who we are. We're the dreamers and doers, and it is our time to seize that mantle once again. That's what I see in our future. That's why I wanted to come back. My heart never left. My body did, and now I've reunited both of those. I want to harness that passion and give a dose of it to every West Virginia and, um, and the world, for that matter. Um, so, Brad, um, what have we not touched on today that you'd like to actually talk just a little bit about. And Sarah, I think we may be even a little ahead of schedule. So maybe there are time for other questions from others, but there's one final one from me. Well, Mike, I do have a, an idea I wanna share. And some of what I talk about here, as you know, and you and I've worked together for years, is there's a cliche in the Silicon Valley that says the best experiment to run is one someone else already ran for you and proved that it worked. So we learned remote work from others. You know, we have studied how Pittsburgh and Detroit and Ireland reinvented themselves, and that's what became the startup state for West Virginia. And, you know, in school, it's called plagiarism. In business, it's called benchmarking. It's legal. We're allowed to do that, and then we're allowed to make it our own. 
And here's an idea I want to put out because I think our state legislators and we and our universities can think about this and learn from it. I came across a program at Connecticut. They're trying to prevent brain drain as well, where their youth are leaving the state. And they have put together two programs that I think are worth us learning more about. The first is if you graduate from a university in Connecticut, now let's replace that with West Virginia. And then if you stay in the state, for each year you stay in the state, they forgive 10% of your student loan. So at the end of 10 years, you'll get 100% of your student loan back. Now they've done the math that shows if you've been in the state for somewhere five to seven years, you're pretty much gonna stay there. So it's a great way to retain their graduates by saying, if you stay here and you get a job or you create a business here, in 10 years, your student loan will be forgiven. Then the other thing they did is they offered a, an income tax credit and it's $2,500 a year each year you stay in the state and they take your $2,500 and put it in an interest bearing account. So at the end of 10 years, you've got $250,000 plus interest to use as a down payment on the mortgage on a home. So imagine if we had programs where we're working with our education system and our legislators to say, we want our best and brightest to stay here. And if you stay 10 years, you can work your way through where your student loan debt's forgiven and you'll come out with a nest egg where you ultimately will have the ability to actually have a down payment on a home as well or a bigger home. And I think those kinds of creative programs which are happening around us would be wonderful for our state to embrace, especially as we're producing this tremendous talent and we have the ability to try to retain them and have them build the next chapter for our state. It's fantastic and it's a great thought. And I expect that if the legislators weren't in interim session right this moment, any of them who listen to this and just heard what you said will probably be introducing a bill in January <laughs> along those lines. So wonderful thoughts. Um, I, well, I can't thank you enough for your time and um, today and, and sharing your thoughts. And um, and I, as I said earlier, I, I can't wait to work with you more closely. Um, very exciting. And I do believe that over the past three years, the Development Office, Commerce, Others have really been focused on intentionally diversifying our economy, and it's really showing up. And you know, frankly, we've we've created an environment in the state that um, we're getting some looks that we never got before, and so that's really terrific. Well, um, Mike, I echo what Sarah said. Uh, there are tremendously talented leaders in this state in all corners, but I don't think I've ever met a harder working person who does it for the purpose and the passion that you do. I have reached out to you at all hours of the day and night on every day of the week, including weekends, and you get back to me immediately. And every opportunity that's ever come in as an inbound inquiry, you close the loop just that fast. So you are our greatest ambassador and you are our greatest catalyst and it's a delight to partner with you. Well, Brad, you're, you're mighty kind to say that, but I do it because I want to and because I've been um, um, given the opportunity and was moved um, to do so, and uh, it has absolutely been fascinating. And uh, you know, I hope I can continue to get to do it for a little bit longer, at least. Um, we do have a couple um, couple minutes for a couple questions, and I would like to start. There, there are some efforts underway, um, like Choose West Virginia, West Virginia Redefine, the My Huntington Movement. Um, I think that you, you're seeing um, community leaders becoming engaged, trying to write West Virginia's full story, build a narrative to kind of dispel some of those misconceptions, Brad, that you mentioned earlier. And I, I, how do you, is, do you think there's a way that we could work together to develop maybe a statewide toolkit that we could uh, give to other communities to, to try to um, capture our Appalachian stories and promote to a broader audience? I do, Sarah. First of all, I am so excited to see all those things. And I've had the chance to participate in local podcasts and some of the local regional efforts that you just mentioned. And it really comes from a source of pride and a source of trying to lean in and shape the narrative that we want told about us, which is what we need to do. But it reminds me of two things that I think are important for us as a state, because we're a small state. And so it's important that we play our part in the orchestra. The one thing that reminds me of is Ted Sorensen, who was the speechwriter for President Kennedy in the 60s, said that leadership is being more than a good communicator. Leadership is being a translator of dreams. So we need to define what the state dream is. What is the state's narrative? 
And then the second part of that is there's a model known as fixed, flexible, and free. This is what world-class agencies teach. Fixed is 70% of the message needs to be the same no matter who's talking. That's the fixed part. That is the West Virginia umbrella narrative. 20% is flexible, which is okay. Underneath that West Virginia story, here's the three or four flavors you can tell depending upon who the audience is. Then the last 10% is free, which is, okay, this is your local region. Now shine your flag and your light on yourself and say, this is who we are. So I hope that as we do this, to answer your question, we think about a model where we get really clear what the West Virginia story is. We make that the umbrella for all of our stories. We then start to tell flavors of that, depending upon whether we're Northern West Virginia, the Eastern Panhandle, the South. And then when you get to the specific community, just put the broader umbrella because we are stronger together than we are apart. So um, Stephanie Tauri was talking, are there model communities that are expanding diversity and inclusion, trying to invite people in that maybe you have come across in your research that could be models to, uh, to us as we move forward? Yes, there are, but I'll, I'll actually break it down into some models to learn from and what were the techniques that we were able to decode so that we have a formula or an approach for West Virginia. So an example would be Tulsa, Oklahoma is a great example. Salt Lake City, Idaho is another example. So those are two that you can kind of go learn from. But what they did is they have a five point plan. The first is there is no for us without us. Said another way, people want to see themselves in the leadership, see themselves in the community. So people who are people of color, underrepresented minorities, they want to see other underrepresented minorities. So we need to make sure we're building diversity of communities. The second is we need to make sure that we have goals, not quotas. We have no problem measuring things like the GDP or the graduation rates or our grade point averages. But then when we say that we wanna make sure we have a mix of women leaders and men leaders or black leaders, and all of a sudden when we all know that's a front of action and that's not good. Yes, it is. In fact, diversity leads to better outcomes, leads to stronger business results. So we need to have goals and we need to work our way towards those goals. The third is we need to align incentives. So we need to encourage and incentivize people for doing the right thing and discourage people when they don't do the right thing. The fourth is we need to encourage courageous conversations, civil discourse. There was a speech once made at a memorial service for Martin Luther King. And this person said, Martin Luther King used to speak without being offensive. He learned to listen without being defensive. And he left even his harshest adversary with their dignity after a disagreement. So we need to cultivate this environment where we're able to disagree in a civil fashion and still sit down and have a cup of coffee. And then the last is we need to listen and act. So we need to listen to what's working and not working and then take action to make it better. So that's what these cities have done. That's what these towns have done. I think it's in our hearts. It's who we are. Sometimes we get lost in some of the things that are happening on social media. But when I actually sit face to face with people in West Virginia, this is how we were made. And so that's why I think we have an advantage and we just have to embrace that approach. Well, I couldn't agree more. Um, one other question I'm getting in is that this individual um, absolutely supports design thinking being taught in all schools, but she believes that we may be missing some fundamental like financial education in teaching um, individual finance, financial literacy. I point to the conversation I taught freshman orientation and my smart board went down one day and I was like, okay, we don't have the syllabus, the materials. What do you want to talk about? Well, our students wanted to write a check, learn how to write a check. They had tax questions. Can my parents still claim me? I'm a student now, or do I need to claim myself? How do I buy my first home? Where do I even start? And, and so we spent a whole um, 90 minutes talking about financial literacy. Um, so do you think there's something to that that maybe we're missing and we need to kind of get back to? Absolutely. In fact, and the exciting thing is these resources are free and companies are begging the schools to put them in. So the company that I've represented for 20 years at Intuit has a financial literacy program where we provide the tools for free. We provide Credit Karma for free, Mint for free. We teach you how to do your taxes using TurboTax on your mobile phone. 
and every one of our schools in the nation should be doing that. And there is no upsell or cross sell or anything else. This is truly about building financial literacy. And then there's other groups doing the same thing. Um, the Hope Global Forum, a gentleman by the name of John Hope Bryant, he's an amazing leader and he's been doing this in underrepresented communities and inner cities. And together I serve on his, his board, his advisory board. And so I think we should be doing this in all of our programs. And I love the question that came in and I agree 100%, design thinking and financial literacy are the two key components that should be embedded in all of our education system in the state. And we have one final question. Um, one of uh, the individuals listening in had a question about your ASCEND program and was just curious if um, that will be expanded to carry maybe other communities or is there a toolkit out there to help other communities to find their niche and promote um, outsiders to come to West Virginia and to live, work and play? Yes, so the answer is yes. So right now we're in three host cities originally. It was Morgantown, University Town, Lewisburg, smallest, uh, coolest small town in America, and Shepherdstown, which is a great historic site with access to a lot of metropolitan areas. We're gonna be announcing a couple more host cities coming up next using the criteria that I walked through, the essentials, the vibrancy of downtown, distinctive features and intangibility. And then what we're doing in addition to that is we've developed a consulting arm of Ascend with a community readiness playbook. And we're already working with the mayors and the economic development groups and all these communities to help them get ready and to build up the things they need. So we're literally working with all 55 counties in some way, shape or form because the book has been put up on the website to be downloaded for free. And we actually sit and work with them. So all of that's going on. And the, Sarah, the last piece I'll add is, you know, we've put a lot of effort into marketing Ascend when it reaches 77 countries around the globe. I mean, a lot of people are hearing about it. What we didn't say is in addition to these three host cities, we have a tab for all other West Virginia communities. And so when Huntington ran their own program or Charleston had Charleston Roots or North Marion County, we put their videos up for them and we've been sending them leads and an example is one of those communities only had a 10 slots we sent them 1500 people who were interested so we're marketing the whole state and that's how everyone's benefiting from this program no that is amazing that is fantastic well thank you so much for joining us today on small communities big solutions our economy day um, if you are not inspired by these two gentlemen, I don't know what will get you there. So thank you so much, uh, Brad and Mike. We appreciate it very much. And we look forward to working with you in the future. So now we're going to wrap up and uh, we'll take a quick 10 minute break. We'll, I'll see you at 1150 away and allow you an opportunity to win some gift cards and have a little fun. Thanks so much, gentlemen.